All right, so today I want to introduce you to the genetic banded ball python. The genetic banded essentially reduces the pattern on the ball python, almost giving it a tiger stripe appearance, which is kind of interesting. And I'd say it's probably one of the most confusing genes in all of ball pythons. You can actually go over to morphmarket.com and do a search for genetic banded, and it'll pull up maybe about 35 total ball pythons out of like 100,000 snakes over there. So it's not really that popular. And one of the confusing things is there's several different common names for the genetic banded. And some of those common names are pretty much exactly the same as other combinations using completely different genes, which you kind of have to watch out for buying into a genetic banded project. And the other thing is, is a lot of people, they'll have like dinkers or like wild caught imports from Africa and call them so-called genetic banded dinkers, which technically it's, it's not really a proven genetic banded. So some of the genetic bandits you can find are not proven as genetic. So they're not, they're actually won't transfer that pattern to the offspring. So sometimes you have to kind of be careful buying into the genetic banded project. So today I want to jump over the internet and I want to show you the potential and some of the confusing aspects of the genetic banded ball python. All right, so I'm gonna jump over here at morphmarket.com and I wanna start with this snake right here. This is a genetic banded ball python. And the genetic banded essentially is a pattern mutation. You can definitely see in this one, it gives you almost like tiger stripes on the side of the ball python. I've actually seen some over here that have tiger stripes pretty much from head to tail all the way up and down the snake. And this one, it looks like there's just tiger stripes on one part. If you actually look at the color on this one, you can definitely tell it almost has like a normal looking color, like the normal classic wild type ball python. So it's not really a color enhancing gene. It really just changes and alters the pattern. And there's quite a few other pattern enhancing genes in ball pythons. There's the Enchi, which you may have heard of. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of Enchis that kind of give you this tiger stripe appearance. But if you actually compare a lot of Enchis pretty much side by side with the genetic bandit, the genetic bandit a lot of times will have thinner stripes uh, compared to the Enchi. And a lot of times the stripes will be a little bit further apart than you'd see in a lot of your kind of a tiger striped NG combination and kind of the other thing is usually with genetic banded pretty much all the time you'll have stripes like the tiger stripes and with the NGs when you do get tiger stripes I'd say it's probably maybe one out of four snakes that'll actually have tiger stripes but a lot of times the NGs won't give you these stripes on the side of the snake but there is one gene that looks almost identical to the genetic banded and take a look at this one this is actually the KRG also known as the calabash reduction gene and I say this is probably almost as popular popular as the genetic banded over here on, on Morph Market. There's not a whole lot of them that have been produced. And I actually did a video on the KRG versus the Enchi, which is kind of an interesting video. And I found pretty much they're completely different genes. At first glance, it almost looks like Enchi, but you see the KR KRG actually has these really super thin tiger stripes with a lot of distance between the stripes, real similar to the genetic banded. So take a look at this. I kind of wanted to compare a couple combinations. The genetic banded directly compared to the KRG. I found I found just a couple examples over here. Let me tell you, with something like the KRG or the genetic banded, there's not a whole lot of examples, so it's really hard to compare them side by side. It's hard to know exactly what's going on unless you produce like hundreds and hundreds of them. There's just like a couple dozen over here. So I'm kind of you know sometimes you kind of grasp at straws on some of these new projects. But I kind of wanted to show you this one. This is actually the super genetic banded fire which is an interesting combination if you actually look at the genes on this one this is the super genetic banded indicating that it's a co-dominant and you can actually have two copies of the genetic banded that's kind of the the technical lingo that we use over here in morph market if you actually take a look at this one it looks like pretty much the same color as a fire with kind of almost like this spider web almost like a blocky spider web kind of a pattern and take a look at this snake and compare it to this one this is the Fire KRG. Almost looks almost looks like exactly the same snake, which is pretty amazing. Kind of has the same kind of a fire color with kind of this blocky spider web pattern right down the top of the snake, which is pretty amazing. 
So take a look at this one. This is actually an albino super bandit. So this is where it gets a little bit confusing. This one's listed as a super bandit, but if you actually come over here and take a look at the genes, it actually just has one copy of the genetic bandit gene. And the more I look over here and more far, it seems like a lot of people are calling the genetic bandit the super bandit, which is pretty interesting. Pretty interesting and pretty confusing. So the other one was actually listed as the super genetic bandit. So was that really two copies of the gene or was it really just one and someone was naming it the genetic bandit. So that's kind of up in the air if, you know, if this is really, you know, it has a super form. And if kind of from this one over here, you actually look at the super genetic bandit file. It looks like there is a super form, but it can be kind of confusing. It's, it's, it's really confusing comparing it to the KRG with almost the identical appearance with the super genetic bandit compared to one copy of the KRG. So it gets a little bit gray, a little bit fuzzy with all the kind of the lines between the different versions of kind of what's going on. So I kind of want to show you a couple of examples where we can actually mix the, the genetic bandit into some combinations. There's not a whole lot to choose from over here in Morph Market. And I want to show you this one, the pastel vanilla, because I actually found one over here with the pastel vanilla and genetic bandit. So you can kind of see the influence of the genetic bandit on the combination. And it gets a little bit tricky in some of these combinations because if you take a look at this one, it almost looks like it's banded right from the start. It almost has these, these bands coming right down. But you almost can tell it's almost like alien head looking kind of a pattern on here and essentially the pastel brings in a lot of the yellow in the combination and then the vanilla is essentially is similar to fire in a lot of combinations where it'll bring out a lot of the brightness and enhance a lot of the combinations as far as the brightening and a lot of times with the vanilla and the working in with pastel it'll actually really wipe out the head on this combination so here's what happens if you take the pastel vanilla and you work it into the genetic banded take a look at this this is kind of interesting Interesting. Essentially what this is, is you can definitely tell the genetic banded kind of separates all the patterns and sometimes it's hard looking at different breeders and different lines of different snakes. Sometimes the pastels can really vary. I've actually seen some pastels that are pretty banded too. So sometimes if you actually, you know, you are comparing these side by side, so it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's kind of a stretch to actually compare. But you can definitely tell in this one it almost seems like it has tiger stripes from the genetic banded and it seems like there's quite a bit of distance between the tiger stripes so I'm definitely thinking that you can see an influence in this combination. So take a look at this. This is another example where someone actually listed super banded with just one copy of the genetic banded. And this is kind of an interesting example. This is the super banded yellow. This is the super banded belly. So this has yellow belly and genetic banded in the mix. And you can definitely tell you have tiger stripes on this one. And it's not quite as separated as you see on a lot of other examples. And I think it's maybe the yellow belly influence bring, kind of bringing some of the bands together. But that is pretty amazing. How it almost looks like a tiger in this example. That is kind of crazy. If you actually look at the price on this project, this is only like $325, so it's not really that high end of a project. As a matter of fact, I actually saw some super bandits over here. They're like under $100, which is kind of crazy. So take a look at this one. This is actually the spider yellow belly, and we can compare this working the genetic banded into this combination. And this one's a little difficult too, because sometimes the spider can almost have these stripes right down the top. And essentially the spider kind of gets its name from the spider web pattern on the top of the snake. And if you actually work yellow belly into a lot of combinations, essentially you get like a brightening effect, brings out a lot of the yellows and oranges in a lot of combinations. So here's what happens if you take the spider yellow belly and work in the genetic band take a look at this this is kind of interesting you can definitely see the tiger stripes coming in on this snake you can definitely see I'd say well as a matter of fact I actually saw some spiders over here that were pretty close just standalone spiders that I'd say but you know sometimes you can get a, on a spider every now and then that has kind of this tiger pattern to it but in every single case that I've noticed over here when you're mixing spider with the genetic banded you get some really strong tiger stripes in your combinations 
So speaking of tigers, take a look at this. This is where it gets really even more confusing. This is actually an albino pied tiger, which is, if you actually look at the genes on this one, this is the albino and pied, both recessive genes, and they're calling the genetic banded the tiger, which is another slang for the genetic banded. And it gets pretty confusing with all the different genetic bandits and the, and the slang names, the tiger, and if there's really a super, and you're calling them, you know, one copy of the genes, the supers, it's, let me tell you, it's one of the most confusing projects over here in ball pythons. I actually pulled up this other one. Take a look at this. This is uh, actually listed as a genetic tiger, which is a pretty interesting name for this particular example. If you actually take a look at this, it almost looks like a genetic stripe, which is which is kind of interesting. If you actually look down here, this is the genetic tiger M and S line. So pretty much what I'm thinking, what may be going on with the with the, the genetic banded is, is kind of the genetic banded. As a matter of fact, let me, let me show you this snake first. Take a look at this. This is a genetic banded type dinker, which is, is essentially what it is. This is like a normal type of ball python with kind of a genetic banded type pattern on the side of these. So you actually see some dinkers and some African imports that are listed over here as genetic banded. If you actually take a look, people are listing them as genetic banded. So what I'm thinking is really going on is I think genetic banded is kind of like we see some genetic banded type pattern on some of these ball pythons. So sometimes we're not 100% sure if it's actually genetic banded or if it just has that pattern in it. And I think what a lot of people are doing is they're taking these genetic bandits, which sometimes they're not proven to be genetic, and then they breed them out and then they prove them out. And sometimes you can prove them out to be different than everything else, and then they kind of spin them out into like the KRGs, the Calabash reduction gene. I think that is another version of the genetic bandit. I think a lot of them kind of get all clumped together as genetic band and then they get spun out into these other lines which is kind of interesting. So I wanted to show you one more here at the end. This is kind of another point of confusion when it comes to genetic bandit. The genetic bandit sometimes is referred to as the tiger, but there's also another tiger, which is confusing. This particular tiger consists of two genes, the Enchi and the desert. And the desert is one gene you might want to stay away from. As a matter of fact, there's only a few, I'd say probably about a dozen deserts over here on uh, Morph Market. And the problem with the deserts is they used to be really popular when they first came out and they quickly found out that the desert had a problem with the fertility of the females. The females essentially when they lay eggs they lay all in fertile eggs and I've actually heard a lot of times when the females lay eggs they'll actually die which is a really big problem with the desert and usually the deserts over here the only ones you'll really find a lot of times are the males and if you actually do find a female desert a lot of times they'll sell it as a pet quality only. If you buy a female desert let me tell you you do not want to breed your female desert to anything else it's pretty much just a pet. So the, uh, it gets a little bit confusing because this is actually the tiger, which is the Enchi in the desert, also the, pretty much the same name as the genetic bandit. And then it also gets a little bit more confusing because the desert is similar to the desert ghost, which is a really awesome gene. The desert ghost is probably one of the most underrated genes in all of ball pythons. It's a pretty amazing gene. As a matter of fact, I'm working quite a bit with the desert ghost. And a lot of people ask me, hey, that's a desert ghost. Is, it, is there a problem with the females? And it's like, no, that is completely separate for the desert. It gets pretty confusing between all the different lingo and all the different common names. All right, so it is time for the question of the day. And Trixie Stitches asks, is there any problems with not breeding your ball python its entire life? And that is a very good question. As a matter of fact, you really don't have to breed ball pythons. That's pretty much the focus of my channel. I'm always talking about what we can breed together and all the cool combinations you can make, but really you don't have to breed one. As a matter of fact, if you're getting one just as a pet, probably what I would do is I'd probably get a male similar to Bobby here. And they say the females get a little bit bigger, but I think, I think the females get bigger because people tend to feed them a little heavier because they're trying to to breed them. I think males can get almost as big as females, although the jury is still out on that one. And kind of the interesting thing with the females is even if you don't breed that female, sometimes it can still lay viable eggs. And kind of the bummer is, is if you actually have a female and it actually lays eggs without breeding it, you can actually have that female get egg bound and you can run into complications with an egg bound female, even though you've never bred it. So if I was to get just one pet ball python, I'll probably spend a little bit more money, get something 
really fancy, like a bamboo or something like that, and probably get a male so you don't have to kind of worry about it ever developing eggs or anything like that. As a matter of fact, when I, I take my ultrasound and I look inside of the females before the breeding season, almost all the time I'll see little immature follicles in those females that don't develop, which is kind of interesting. So it almost seems like there's always little immature eggs in the females. Sometimes they can develop through parthenogenesis, which is kind of an interesting anomaly in ball pythons. I'd probably stick with the male and you definitely do not have to breed your ball python. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.